Chapter 4 Lily They were called bondage pants. In reality, they were just overpriced skinny jeans with straps crisscrossing several layers of metal studs in two diagonal patterns. My long boots hid the bottom third of my trousers, along with some extra artillery. My top half was swathed in a blouse, or so one could generously label the shreds of fabric layered in a way that barely concealed my torso and did fuck all to keep autumn air off my skin. I'd toned down my natural blonde with layers of temporary red and silver dye and straightened my normal mess of curls, making the mass hang far past the middle of my back. A rub on tan over my pale skin and makeup that made me look like a reject from a Marilyn Manson music video completed the look. Alex had snapped several photos for future blackmail while our other roommates laughed before I could leave the house. Not that I blamed them. I'd chosen the goth girl look for several reasons. Chief among them, the excessive makeup made my normal features harder to pick out. On top of that, if I looked like I used Sharpie for mascara, it tended to make my lack of social skills more excusable. Typically, you stand in a corner, people watching at a party, and someone tries to approach you. Then the social butterfly gets all pissy when you tell them to shove off, drawing a lot of unwanted attention. So far, the ugly makeup was doing its job. Everyone seemed to buy the ruse. I was just some bitchy girl with a bad attitude. I overheard someone asking if they should kick me out, but their concerns were set aside because I wasn't bugging anyone. Still, I got jostled by other partygoers as they danced badly to the obnoxious bass, nearly spilling my room temp beer as I hunched my shoulders and surveyed the crowd. So far, all the people surrounding me seemed to have heartbeats, but I could have missed a skip in the thumps with the crappy music. I was a little surprised the rattling windows were surviving. I turned around to check again and almost broke into laughter. Some poor sod was passed out on the cheap sofa, one of his arms sprawled over his face as he snoozed. A few partygoers stood around him, each with a different shade of magic marker, as they debated what to do with the kid's face. Hey, come on. I stepped forward to tell the group to leave the poor kid alone before he ended up with dicks all over his face. I stopped short when I saw the guy's snoring countenance. I knew that face. Where the hell did I know this guy from? A kid wearing a do-rag snorted. This rich jerk should know better than to pass out around here. I looked up to retort, but his rich jerk comment clicked something into place, and I looked back down. This was the guy I'd seen macking on his car when I was looking through Facebook yesterday. Had he been in the Facebook event? I scrolled through my memory and almost swore with frustration. I was certain he hadn't been on the list of people attending, even when I had checked this morning. Adrian St. Clair had been, though I hadn't seen that distinctively hooked nose yet. Had I missed something? Durag said something and I shook my head to clear it. Huh? You want in on this? Durag held out a marker and I shook my head again. He's all yours. I turned on my heel and tried to blend back into the crowd of miscreants while making a mental note to do more research on Corvette Guy later. Anna wouldn't see me until tomorrow, so I decided to attend the party tonight. Alex hadn't liked it, pointing out that any vampire could use their extra senses to scout me in return. It was a risk, but seeing as seven victims had grabbed the court's radar, this guy was probably too cocky to think about watching for his own kind. So I wandered randomly from one partygoer to the next, listening for the telltale skip in the rhythm of heartbeats. Right as I decided I needed a new cup of stale camouflage to sip, I heard the front door open. One set of footsteps followed the loud thud of the door closing. Only footsteps. I fought the sudden urge to snap my head up. The newcomer would have the same predatory instincts. Any sudden motion would make my dark primping a huge waste of time. 
So I continued my steady stride to the keg. Once my red cup was refilled, I turned around to take in the whole room before I took in the newcomer. His appearance almost made me snort. Even two years after we'd been outed to humanity, the warning posters still made us look like supermodels. Their skin was paler than mine, and they flashed seductive smiles, a big warning sign about the temptations. If only the proprietors of those billboards could get a look at this guy. The newcomer looked to be in his 30s by modern standards. He was short and had the misfortune of being turned with a pot belly forever frozen to his gut. That alone told me he was most likely young in undead years. Obesity had been rare before the 1950s. His head shined under a bad comb over that no one was buying. In other circumstances, I would have told him to be bald and be proud, but I wanted to see what he was up to. I sauntered in another direction to avoid his immediate attention. Newbie though he may be, I didn't know enough about what crown he was under, or even if he was the dealer. While chances were low he had just come to relax, I didn't want to assume this was my guy without proof. I needed to wait for evidence. I didn't have to wait long. Not even ten minutes after I'd spotted him, I learned his name was Joey as he'd accepted several shoulder slaps and all sorts of drunken bro hugs. Many of the greetings were accompanied by questions about Coke or Sherry Coke. I nearly rolled my eyes at the lack of originality when I heard the street name. What cabbage had come up with that? Still, at least I knew I had the right vamp. I kept myself on the edge of the crowd, craning my neck in obvious absorption. Everyone was staring, no need to stand out feigning a lack of interest. Joey started pulling small Ziploc bags of ruby-colored powder from his coat pockets, holding a handful up in each fist for the crowd. Several drunken yells accompanied my shock at this show. True, I'd figured whoever I was chasing was a novice at troublemaking, but this was ridiculous. Couldn't he at least do the selling in a quiet back room or something? Being this blatant wasn't just daring. It was like a fucking billboard. I was glad everyone was staring. I couldn't peel my eyes away if my life depended on it. Money and red powder began changing hands quickly. It wasn't long before the room split between those partaking in the new entertainment and those not. A coffee table was set with several cherry-colored lines and surrounded by several enthusiasts. I kept reminding myself that stopping tonight's transactions would probably only give the court an inexperienced pawn. While that was a decent start, it was also easy to stop the trade here and start somewhere else if I didn't get a few rungs higher up the ladder from Joey. So, I stayed with the crowd of pot smokers and thanked God I didn't need to breathe. The smell alone would have been enough to make me consider leaving or blowing my cover. Luckily, the perpetual fuck-off sign I directed across my forehead also kept away any offers for hits and dances. I leaned against the wall, playing one of the games Maria had stuck on my phone and trying to look disinterested. I occasionally paused the game to snap a few photos with my camera. Little colored blobs swirled in and out of existence as I matched them haphazardly and tuned my hearing to the conversations across the room. Granted, tuning out all the other distractions and noise when I chose to use my enhanced ears was a bit of a nuisance. But once I got a mental lock on Joey's voice and slow speech pattern, it was easy enough to filter for the responses. About an hour of low scores and five stale refills later, Joey had negotiated price on a few sales, educated some new users on best practices, and shooed away one guy looking for a free high. Still, he hadn't mentioned anything supernatural like I'd been expecting. Come on, man. What do you put in this stuff? It's incredible. This was the fifth attempt at learning the secret ingredient. Joey donned a poor imitation of a British accent to reply. If I tell you, I'm afraid you won't even try it. He followed this with repeated slurps of his tongue to continue the Hannibal Lecter impersonation. I snorted and almost shot beer through my nose. 
A real vampire mocking a fake human cannibal? That was fucking brilliant. It would have been great under other circumstances. Joey had turned every prod for information into a joke or redirected the conversation. I was curious what he would do if someone got pushy. Could be worth finding out. And it wasn't like I was doing much else. Another 45 minutes later, I was dancing poorly to keep up with the drunk partygoer next to me. His breath was coated in beer and weed. It was pungent even without the need to take an air. Still, I needed him. Not for what he had in mind as his snake hipped the air near my body, but he did have value. I'd made it seem like the massive number of drinks were getting to me, slowly peeling the scowl from my face and making myself more inviting. After all, going from cold bitch to ooh, fuck me would have been a bit too obvious. After I'd feigned a little shy giggling, Dean had shown me his tattoos in the hopes of breaking the last bit of my eyes. He even pretended to be interested in my days in Ireland, but I verbally skated around the topic. Bloody accent. There were definitely days I thought about learning to talk without it, but it was the only thing I had left of home. That and some shitty memories. As we white girl danced, I'd given him a few feather soft kisses, barely keeping the inner grimace off my face. Acting like I was warming up should have earned me an Emmy right there, but I needed this to go just a little further for what I had in mind. I leaned in for another kiss, lingering in a way that I hoped seemed inviting. Apparently, it was. Dean leaned in further and stuck that disgusting tongue right on in, gently gripping the back of my neck at the same time. It took all of my energy not to rip my head out of his grasp. Dean's breath had told me he'd indulged too much, while his kiss told me he had no clue how to use a toothbrush. Come on, even the undead could keep good dental hygiene. Revulsion slithered through every nerve in my body, and I fought a shiver crawling up my spine. I counted to ten to make sure the kiss was long enough, chanting to myself, fake it till you make it. I pressed on, moaning softly, hoping it sounded like I was enjoying the moment. Another Academy Award, apparently, because Dean started slipping his hands through the holes of my shirt to caress my skin. I pushed at his hands, barely remembering to check my strength to chipmunk levels. My room temp skin hadn't given me away, but he'd probably notice if a girl who looked about 50 pounds lighter than him was somehow stronger. Still, no way in hell I could let him reach below my blouse. Can we go somewhere more private? Hell yeah, we can. Dean gripped my hand, telling me that my blood circulation really sucked. I stifled a laugh, grateful the music swallowed some of the noise. He led me to the back of the packed house and some obvious bedrooms. The first door had a couple behind it who'd forgotten to lock the knob. The smell of sweat and some soft groans had given me that first tidbit, while Dean opening the door to a surprised shriek had told me the second. After another door that was properly locked, he edged the last door open with more caution, pulling me closer for another kiss. We were still in view of the party, so the show must go on, but I couldn't wait for Dean to lock that door. The minute Dean turned back from the lock, I gave him a direct stare. A look of shock crossed his features right before his jaw went a little slack and his eyes glazed. I knew without looking that my eyes would look like the pupil had swallowed all the color. I smiled, thankful my seduction was over and wishing desperately for a breath mint. I didn't feel too bad about using Dean. Once I was done with him, I'd wipe his memory and give him a new one of the drunken passions he'd been angling for. The least I could do was leave him with some fake whoopee, right? All right, you're going to get some of that sherry coke outside and bring it back to me. I kept my voice low to avoid Joey overhearing my directive. Between my whisper and the loud party music, I should be okay. He hadn't even glanced my way all night. You'll just know you need it to loosen up your date. Once you're done buying, Ask the dealer what makes it so powerful. If he tries to not answer you, 
Ask again, but don't push him if he gets angry. Dean nodded, still looking a bit like an extra from The Walking Dead. My grin widened as I let the color slowly come back into my gaze. Okay, go out there and remember, the sooner you come back, the sooner you get lucky. As soon as I shut off my power, Dean blinked and looked natural again. He smiled crookedly and leaned over to give me another quick kiss. Don't worry, baby, I got you covered. He opened the door and slinked out. I didn't bother putting my ear to the hollow wood. It wouldn't help. The door would suppress noise for me about as well as tossing a wet blanket over my head. I shut my eyes and sifted for Joey and Dean's voices. I learned through the inane chatter that there was a line for the red cocaine. Thank God my directive to hurry back hadn't resulted in Dean cutting in front or pissing people off. A little bit of small talk and some blah blahs later, I finally got the conversation I was hoping for. Hey man, I need something to loosen the little lady in the back. Dean's voice. Ah, gotta give your girl some incentive? Joey chuckled with his reply. Good timing. I'm down to two bags. One for each? Dean's response must have been a nod or something, because Joey kept talking like he'd said yes. They talked price for a bit, and I reminded myself to pull a few bills out of my wallet to replace what Dean was losing. Ivan could cover it. Joey made sure Dean knew how to use it, even had him do a sample to get the hang of it. With his proper tone, Joey could have been selling insurance. Hell, I got less professional with some of my PI clients. After the sales pitch was over, Dean came to the main question. Dude, you gotta tell me what makes this stuff so powerful. Never ask a magician to reveal his secrets, my friend. A loud crash announced something breaking open at the front of the house, cutting Joey short. The following bellow identified the literal party crashers. Police! Everyone down! Shite. I dropped my concentration and cracked the door to peek out. Sure enough, armed men came in with their guns drawn. Nobody move! Of course, the command didn't work for everybody. Half the people stood still with shock or rage on their faces. The other half bolted for the open windows or back doors, giving our new company a little extra work. I groaned. Double shite. On one hand, I didn't want the cops getting those last two bags Joey had, or putting them into the evidence to test them. On the other hand, I needed to get out of here before my cover was blown. If I got arrested at this party and fingerprinted, they'd find out who I really was, even if none of them had ever met me at my day job. And that didn't even cover what I was. Dean hadn't figured it out when he touched my chilly skin, but he was drunk and horny. Trained police were another matter entirely. As I saw the approaching officers come down the back hallway, I made up my mind. At least if my cover wasn't blown, I could warn the court we were about to have another media nightmare before it happened. I shut the door as quietly as I could and then switched to my normal speed. My rushed movements disturbed the bedspread and curtains like a strong breeze as I threw the window open. In my haste, I managed to break some glass from the bottom pane. I winced at the instant guilt, but climbed out right as I heard someone make demands for me to open the door I'd just locked. Once outside, I sprinted to the other side of the yard and out of sight from the open window. I heard the sound of wood splintering from the room I'd left, followed by the static of a hand radio as the officer advised his team that someone had gotten away on the north side of the house. I didn't wait for anything else. I hopped to the back fence, glad I hadn't brought my motorcycle. The engine would have grabbed everyone's attention for miles, and I couldn't have left her behind. I slowed to my human speed on the off chance anyone was back here to see me. It sucked I had to leave the drugs behind, but I didn't need anyone witnessing my own vampire activity. I just had to hope Joey got out too, maybe with the rest of his stash in tow. 
I was halfway down the block when a car turned the corner ahead of me, headlights blinding me. Blue and red emitted from the top of the vehicle, and a loud whoop sent a wave of cold panic through my skin. The larger man from Detective Harper's Facebook photo got out and told me to freeze. I held up my hands. Triple shite. You've been listening to a sample of Blood Herring by E.H. Drake. For the complete story, pick up your copy at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or wherever you get your books. Audiobook coming soon.